You've come to the right video if you wanted to know what the keys of the kingdom are, what precisely you have to do to be saved. That is the greatest secret of Christianity. And I could show you that, but if I show you right off, you'll just think, well, okay, you're one voice among thousands, all the Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox. They argue over this text all, all day long, and none of them seem to be able to agree on anything. So you're just one voice among many. I am going to prove to you all those guys are wrong. Catholic Answers, Karm, and all the big names, when they spoke on this text, they blew it. And the reason why they blew it is that monster on the right, the two-faced god of duality, Roman mythical god, he has something to do with why they are all wrong. And I'm going to prove that in this video. And once I do that, and you're going to see it with your own eyes, I'm going to prove it beyond any reasonable doubt. You will believe me when I give you the keys of the kingdom. You will know precisely what they are, where that door is, and you'll be able to open it up, and you and your family and friends can walk on through. Believe me, it's a wonderful thing. And that will happen in the beginning of this video. After I prove all those guys wrong, all the big scholars and the apologists and everybody else wrong about this text, then I could perhaps show them this asymmetric Janus parallelism hiding in plain sight. But they won't see it until I get them to throw away some of what they already believe because they just got it wrong. Now, the reason why they got it wrong, it's not because I'm all that smart, but I discovered that back in that Aramaic that Christ and his apostles spoke, there was a word, Petros, an Aramaic word, that when transliterated into Greek was spelt just like Petros stone. And the early church mistook the two. They confused them. What happened was the Roman Empire cast the children of Israel out of the Palestine, and that destroyed that Hebrew Aramaic culture as far as the Greek speaking church was concerned. So when they saw the word Petros in our Greek New Testament, they naturally thought it was a Greek word. They didn't realize it was an actual hominem. It was an Aramaic word that was spelt like the Greek word. And then Christ used both of those meanings to create an asymmetric genus parallelism in Matthew 16, 18 through 19. But to prove, to show them that, first I got to show them that they're all wrong. Otherwise, they won't believe me. So you bear with me. If you came here just wanting to know what you have to do to be saved, I'm going to help you first. And you're going to know that right away. And then, in the process, I'm going to prove all them guys wrong. And then maybe they'll endure it They'll uh, and check this out because this is a wonderful thing. This whole context is really wonderful. I know they want to know this, but, you know, the, uh, it's hard to admit you got something wrong. But I hope they do. And when they do, they'll be glad they did. Now, for those of you in a real, real hurry, there's the keys right there. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter confessed those, and Christ declared him blessed. Now, why is it that he said, I will give you the keys? Well, that's because we all live on a linear, temporal, finite level of existence. God, however, is an eternity. For example, there's a text that says that Christ was slain at the foundation of the world. Even though we know that happened in the first century, when he was crucified. But from God's perspective, things are eternal and time doesn't really matter like it does for us. From God's perspective, when he confessed that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, that is the word of faith, which according to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, when you confess that publicly, with the heart man believeth on the righteousness, with the mouth confession is made on his salvation. He did it publicly. He was saved at that time. Christ declares him blessed. But from a point of view of time, there's a timeline here. It has to await for the resurrection of Christ. Only after Christ rises from the dead 
did that channel of God's grace come into existence, that door into heaven, the keys, that living water that comes from the massive petrol rock of Christ, and then there's the little lively stones that the church is, and they also give out living water because out of their bellies flow living water. Well, that channel of God's grace where the keys exist didn't exist until Christ rose from the dead and began building his church. So building the church and getting the keys is put into the future, but that's from our linear, finite point of view from the eternal perspective of God Peter was born again right here and Christ declared him blessed so those are the keys if you got no more time and you want to end here hey but chances are you're not sure if I'm telling you truth or not you don't know if I'm right so you're gonna to have to stick with me a little longer I'll prove it to you now, the way I'm going to prove Catholic Answers, Karm, all the apologists, all the big schools, all the high dollar commentaries you can get are wrong, is I'm going to focus on Matthew 7, 24, 25. They never do that. If they did, the argument would stop. They'd all have to get together and sing Kumbaya. That top context, Matthew 7, 24, 25, critically speaking, I'm a very logical guy, critically speaking, this is an apples to apples comparison. I have color coded the properties or the ideas that are common to both. These sayings of mine, and I got the yellow highlight on built this house in a rock, the green rock, Petra, and the red, the rains, floods, winds, those are paralleled in the bottom context. And we're going to go through that point by point, and you'll see that if they interpreted the top context the way Christ set it up, then they must interpret the bottom context the way Christ set it up. And when they do that, they're all wrong. They Everything they have to say about this text is wrong. Now, of course, they're wrong to different degrees, but they all fundamentally are in error. And I'm going to prove that, and when I do, my bona fides are established, my credentials, my standing, because quite frankly, I'm a lowly taxi driver, and you got all them big guys to, you know, in the big schools, and they look like they should know what they're doing, but they don't. They're not critical thinkers. They totally blew it on Matthew 7, 24, 25. This is apples to apples. And you must interpret Matthew 16, 16 through 18, exactly like you do Matthew 7, 24, 25. Logically speaking, it's the only rational thing to do. And when they don't do it, they're being irrational. These sayings of mine, Christ is God, the eternal son, second person of the Holy Trinity. Whatever he says is divine revelation, and it's therefore immutable, because God never lies. What he teaches doesn't change. So the teachings of Christ never change. It's immutable. Same thing with the revelation that the Father in heaven gave to Peter. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. That is unchanging truth from the God who cannot lie, and it's about the identity of the immutable Son of God. So therefore, it's unchanging to the nth degree. Now you notice on top, we're building a house upon a rock, and on the bottom, building a church on a rock. So it's the same theme. On the top, it's a wise man, and on the bottom, it's Christ. But either way, you're building on a rock. Now, a rock never changes. You could watch a rock your entire life, and it won't change one little bit. Therefore, it's the perfect metaphor for unchanging divine revelation. Now, notice, look at the way Christ set that up. He said, whosoever heareth his sayings, he likened him to a wise man building on a rock. So building on a rock is hearing his sayings. You could put it this way. 
I liken him to a wise man building on these sayings is the same as whosoever heareth is building his house on a rock. Because the equivalency is there. This is what Christ himself set up, the eternal son of God. He is calling his sayings, metaphorically, the Petra rock, because it doesn't change. That's total metaphor in, uh, metaphor coherence. Now when we look at the bottom text, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. That is immutable divine truth from God the Father in heaven. Is Peter immutable? He, although he was declared blessed right there in verse 17, in verse 23, Christ says, get behind me, Satan. So now there's there's something really unmutable uh, about that. That's a total change. <laughs> I mean, that's a radical change. Now, some people think Peter's confession is the rock. Well, remember now, here he, he confesses Christ. But just a few, a little while later at the crucifixion, Peter denied Christ three times. So his confession is not mut uh, immutable. It changes too. So, no, there's nothing about Peter that's rock-like. The only thing in this context that is rock-like that could possibly be the antecedent of that demonstrative this, in Greek, it's very clear, it's a demonstrative pronoun. Christ is talking to Peter about the rock. The only thing here that's immutable is that divine revelation, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. Now that means the way Christ said it on the top is the way you got to set it, read it on the bottom. And that makes Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, although a lot of Orthodox, they know that's the specific point, wrong. Because it's not Peter's confession. It's not Peter. It's that precise content, thou art the Christ, son of the living God which also are the keys of the kingdom. So there now, we're already seeing how wrong Catholics, Protestants, all those big names in college and, and uh, the Bible schools that argue over this text, none of them. And check it out. I've done that. I've looked because I found it incredible that nobody would look at Matthew 7, 24, 25 when uh, critically speaking, this is apples to apples. It should jump out and, of the text and uh, slap you upside the head. But it doesn't to these people, and I have no idea why. It's here plain as day, and it's not a figment of anyone's imagination. We're going to look at the very next parallel to confirm this. Now, it would appear to be obvious, the connection here. You have rains, floods, and winds blow against the house. And on the bottom, you've got gates of hell blowing against the church. Neither one prevail because what was built was founded on the rock. I, I, it's so, the connection is so apples to apples, you wonder what's wrong with scholars. Well, they overthink it. You know, in most common people, they know if you overthink something, you clutch up. Or you can blind yourself to what's right in front of your face if you overthink things and that's what happens to the scholars they overthink this they see rain floods and winds and they run into the old testament and they look for all the times god speaks about using rain floods and winds and they suppose that he's doing that here so that somehow this becomes prophecy instead of sermon on the mount teaching this is sermon on the mount and yet they think it's prophecy. I'll prove that soon. But because they think it's prophecy, they don't connect it with Matthew 16, 16 through 18. It totally goes over their head. And that is because, surprisingly enough, a lot of them just aren't critical thinkers. I've seen that in a lot of their works, especially when they start arguing about the, the, the text of the Bible, how they look for the better text the shorter uh, whatever seemeth right to them and they and they suppose that they're actually making the better the bible better by using these manuscripts that the church threw away back in the early centuries and unfortunately that preserved them 
They're not critical thinkers. They pile on fallacy upon fallacy all the time. And, they, and then they impress each other with these complicated hypo, you know, hypotheses that's really just crap. And, and here is a good example where you can overthink something and totally blow it. Now let's see what the scholars have to say on this text. Now that bottom is a quote out of the an exegetical summary of Matthew 1 through 16. I, I actually like that. I use it quite a bit. What they do is they summarize what the major commentaries, and these are high dollar top shelf commentaries, what they have to say about a text. And it's helpful because you, you're getting their great wisdom all in a nice short form, nice short paragraph. And notice what they have to say about the floods and storm, what they represent. They think it's prophetic about the final judgment, ultimate ordeal, death itself, storms of life, upheaval of the last days prior to the end of the world. Now, this is incredible. They're taking the Sermon on the Mount and they're turning it into prophecy. That's totally against the, its genre. It, it's ridiculous, but they do it because they have outthunk themselves. And then they overlay upon this text their their assumptions and once they do that they're blind to it they don't see it anymore they have no idea what this thing says so they run into the book of revelation and they're all scouring it for some clue as to what the rain floods and winds blow and actually that's that's what they are it's just a an imagery of a storm coming against the house because that's all it is is it's teaching it's classic two-way teaching now here's some examples of two-way genre now let's focus first on Christ's uh, Sermon on the Mount here he's talking about a wise man who builds on his sayings and then there's the unwise man who doesn't build on his sayings the wise man's house is able to withstand the forces of nature the unwise man's house is not so this is classic two-way genre. In Deuteronomy 30:19, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Two-way genre. You're supposed to choose the better one to choose life. Or right here in the Sermon on the Mount, just a few verses up, you got the narrow gate and the broad way. That's two-way genre. So we have right here in the Sermon on the Mount, two examples of two-way genre right here on the screen. So why did the scholarship realize that? Because they overlaid upon the text some theory about it being prophecy, and then they ran into the Old Testament, and they, oh, look at it, this is the judgment of God. And then they run to the end of, uh, end of time, and Oh, yeah, this has got to be some special test. Uh, it's blindness is what it is. Total blindness. That's why they don't see the connection between 7, 24, 25 and Matthew 16, 16 through 18. Totally blind to it. It's really quite incredible. You know what makes their blindness even worse? If we were going to read into the forces of nature some kind of uh, powers of darkness and link that with the gates of hell i mean actually that's really not such a bad supposition you say okay we have gates of hell we have the uh, forces of nature beating on the same obedient uh house yeah that's evil but look at uh, ephesians 6 10 through 12. paul clearly reworked the material in 7 24 25 for his little sermon here and he's changed the wording a little but you'll notice the ideas are the same these sayings of mine the teachings of christ is like being strong in the lord power of his might the wise man builds on these sayings of mine and then he's building on a rock if you stand if you're strong in the lord in the power of his might then what you build can stand against the wiles of the devil and the forces of uh, the rain, the floods, and the winds that come from heaven, beat on the house, 
Look what he says, spiritual wickedness in high places. So clearly Paul has reworked Matthew 7, 24, 25, and probably with the view of Matthew 16, 18, the uh, gates of hell. And he's thinking about all that, and he come up with this little sermon. Clearly, he is not thinking of prophecy when he does this. This is classic two-way genre. And he's telling you, be strong in the Lord, power of his might, because if you're not, you ain't going to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And when the spiritual wickedness in high places come, the collapse of your house will be great. Now I'm just rubbing salt in the wound. I'm belaboring the point. But I, I just have to really hit these scholars hard because, you know, uh, like that woman in that movie where she slapped someone left and right and said, snap out of it. <laughs> Somebody needs to tell them to snap out of it. If you're going to look at the rain, floods, and winds and think about anything, you have to think, well, gee, it's fighting against an obedient person's house. He's building on the sayings of Christ. So it's evil. And then we have the gates of hell fighting, the, beating against the church. That's evil. And right there in the book of Revelation, we have the devil casting water out of his mouth like a flood. Notice in verse 25, we got a flood. The devil casts water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman who represents the church. So we have, this is the, the serpent of hell shooting water out, trying to drown the woman. You know, that sounds like the gates of hell trying to prevail against the church. She represents the church. And then while they were in the Old Testament digging out those texts where God uses floods and all that stuff, how come they skipped over 2 Samuel 22.5? You know, this here, the death, waves of death compensate me. Floods of Belial. Now, that could be a, a parallelism there where Belial, we know that's uh, the devil because in 2 Corinthians 6.15, it clearly is an, another name for the devil. So here, this personification of death could actually represent the devil. So you've got waves from the devil. You have floods of Belial. Why didn't they connect all these dots and say, hey, this is the gates of hell against the church. It's not about the end time judgment day of God. This is about what the devil does before the judgment day when he's still free, able to do something. I know, I'm rubbing salt into the wound. I have to. I'm a cab driver. That's what we do. So logically speaking, this is apples to apples. The four universal ideas common to both. They're color-coded. And then you have a, the same theme, building on the rock. One, it's Christ. The other one's the wise man. It's a wrap. There are no incompatible properties relevant to uh, Petra. Nothing pertinent that would stop that being a metaphor for unchanging divine revelation in both contexts. The sayings of Christ or the revelation of the Father to Peter that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we know from other texts, when you believe in Christ, you're saved. So that clearly is how the church is being built. It's being built on that precise content. Those are the keys to the kingdom. The reason why Peter didn't get them at this point in time is because in our linear existence, they didn't exist then. They only exist when the channel of God's uh, grace is created, the door opens from heaven. It goes through the uh, Christ to the church and out into the world. Until that happens, the keys technically didn't exist. And they, that would only happen after the resurrection of Christ. The keys did not exist apart from the channel of God's grace. Therefore, when Peter received the keys, it implies he had become a Kepha Petros, lively stone of the church. Now, someone might say, I just don't see Peter being born again right here. Well, look at verse 17. Christ broke out into a macarism. Blessed art thou. Now, he never did that before. It's true that 
people before had said, you are the son of God, but they did in response to something Jesus said or did, and Christ never reacted like this when they did it, because it wasn't really a genuine conviction, a statement of belief. When Peter confessed this, and it's the product of divine revelation, never happened before, it's clear that he was believing it in his heart and confessing it with his mouth and that he was saved. And the confirmation of that is the way Christ saw in Peter a parallel to the prophet Jonah. Now, some people will say, where did you see that? Well, I see it in that Aramaic word bar Jonah. Why didn't Matthew translate that into Greek? He didn't. That's like putting a neon sign around that word. Look at this word. It's important. And in this context, it clearly means more than just son of some dude named Jonah. Bar in Aramaic or, or Ben in Hebrew means like a son of, after the order of. Look down at the bottom. Christ often looked at Jonah and saw parallels to what people were doing. He saw a parallel to what he would do when he was in, the, in hell for three days and three nights to what Jonah did when he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah writes that he was in hell when he was in that belly of the fish, and then the fish spit him out on a dry land. That's figurative of a resurrection. And then he went to the city of Nineveh, preaching divine revelation that if any man would hear, would live. Well, look at Peter. He figuratively rose from the dead when he confessed the word of faith, believing in his heart, the Lord Jesus, and he confessed it publicly. So he's born again, figuratively rises from the dead. And now he's preaching the divine revelation that Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God, which if any man will believe and confess, they will live. So Christ calls him Simon bar Jonah, son of the prophet Jonah. It's right here. There's confirmation is there. And then there's another confirmation. But it's, it's more tenuous. Paul writes about, well, God is faithful even if he is faithless. Well, even if Paul, you, when you read Paul's writings, you realize he, there was no point in time when he was faithless. And once he became a Christian, I mean, he was just there. He clearly, very likely, I should say, was thinking about Peter. Peter here is born again. He confesses Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. He's born again. But a few days later, he denies Christ three times. Paul is looking at this event and the denial of Christ, and he's thinking, okay, eternal security. Because even though Peter revoked his confession, God could not deny himself. So here, if you wanted proof for eternal security, it's right here in Peter's confession and in Paul's words. I think you put them both together and then you have eternal security, proof for it like I have never seen before. Let's move on. Now, if you folks who just wanted the keys to stick it with me, you'll enjoy this because it confirms a lot of what I've already said. We're just going to walk real quickly through the parallels that prove Paul is thinking about the Matthew event, 1616, when he wrote Romans 10, verses 6 through 11. Let's look at the equivalence here. They just slightly word differences, but the idea is the same. To bring Christ down from above, Paul can't see Christ without seeing salvation. So bringing Christ down from above is bringing the truth of salvation, that what saves you, from heaven. Well, what did the Father do when he revealed the identity of Jesus Christ to Peter? He brought Christ down from above, put it in his heart, and put it in his mouth. So when the Father revealed to Peter that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, that is like the word being near him, even in his mouth and in his heart. It just appeared there. And confirming that, it's the word we preach, the word that the apostles preach, the Lord Jesus. What is, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? The identity of Christ? The Lord Jesus. It's the same thing. Clearly, Paul is you reworking that material 
for his own little sermon right here. Yeah, I've already mentioned it. Rima, 2 Corinthians 12, 4, is used of those unspeakable words not lawful to utter that someone heard in heaven, and uh, so it's divine revelation. And that's what thou art the Christ, Son of the living God, that's divine revelation. It's the word the apostles preach, the Lord Jesus. You can see the connection. The parallels are clear. The dependency is clear. Well, now it's going to get a little more technical. You folks that just wanted the keys of the kingdom and wanted to know what exactly you had to do to be saved. So you can go out there and save family and friends. And you got them. Precisely. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. You believe in your heart. You confess that with your mouth publicly. You're saved. The door to heaven swings wide open. Now we're going to go to the asymmetric Janus parallelism in Matthew 16, 18. And hopefully you Catholic and Protestants, you apologists, and you scholars, you all have put aside all your theories about this text, this context, and are now suspending that, that jump to disbelieve anything I say. After all, I am a cab driver, so who the hell am I? Just suspend that and just give me the length of this video to check out what I have to say. I believe I'm going to make my case uh, fairly well. And by the time at the end of this video, if you're a critical thinker, you might realize that I have made a good case. And whether you believe it or not, that's still up to you. But I'm going to make a good case from my point of view. That's coming up. So if you enjoy that kind of thing, even if you don't want to believe me, hey, you might really want to hear this argument because then you'll be entertained. You'll be intellectually challenged. Let's get cracking. Now, this is just an outline of the argument that we're going to go through. I, I don't expect you to read it. Please don't even try. Just remember it's over here in slide 21, and I'll repost it at the very end so you, you'll have it there too. And, you know, then that might help you uh, go through my argument. You'll see some of the points. Now, there is the Janus monster. It's asymmetric because the faces are slightly different when you're looking past, when you're looking forward. It's a parallelism because the act of looking back is exactly the same as looking forward. So that's a parallel. A polysemy is a word. It's a homonym, a word with more than one meaning. Rock. Dwayne Johnson, the actor, he's a rock. And Alcatraz, that's a rock. So you put it in a modern parallelism. The rock liberated its prisoners. Now, if you came upon that sentence and you didn't realize it was an asymmetric Janus parallelism, you wouldn't be able to interpret it. It would be inexplicable. You would think, well, a rock is inanimate, and the, the pronoun proves that you're not talking about a person, so... How could it be? But once you realize it's asymmetric Janus parallelism and you're aware that it's a homonym and you know those meanings, then you know that the rock, meaning Dwayne Johnson, liberated its referring to Alcatraz. So you have that forward backward look. This guy, Cyrus Gordon, discovered these in 1978 and they've been causing translators problems up until this time. Now, some of the ancient translations actually realized and translated them correctly, but a lot of them had a problem because they would see that more meaning in the Hebrew than what they could actually translate legitimately because they're trying to focus on one meaning, and when they do that, they lose all that other content. And we'll see that in the next example. Now, I didn't buy Cyrus Gordon's book. The scholars are finding these all over the place. I have no idea what the latest state of the art is on this. But this is the way I interpret this example, and it is one of uh, Cyrus Gordon's examples. Zamir is the homonym. Looking back, it means pruning, looking forward, singing. The King James Version, top translation, they look at Turtle Dove. They springtime and they reason to themselves, okay, we're talking about singing of birds. So they inserted the words of birds into the text. Turtle doves coo, though, they don't sing. Now, the Greek Septuagint 
looking at the same text, they see backward and they see flowers. So, that, okay, flowers. The, the man is pruning flowers. It's springtime has arrived and the turtle doves are cooing in a land. That's not what Solomon was talking about here. The whole picture is one of Romeo. He's got a song in his heart that he's going to sing to the love of his life, the turtle dove. And he's pruning flowers to give to her. So he goes to her with the flowers and with the song, and then she responds with cooing. And the reason why voice of the turtle is heard everywhere is because it's springtime, time of romance, a lot of Romeos, a lot of turtle doves. And it's a beautiful thing. Solomon was actually presenting an entire picture. But look at the way what would happen if you focused, no matter what direction, you lose content. And you need inferential logic to put it together. You have to know it's a Janus, and you have to use your head to think about what's being said here to fill in the gaps, to make the connections. You need that, what John the Apostle would call in the book of Revelation, the mind that has wisdom. You have to put these connections together. And I don't know what Cyrus Gordon says about this context. That's the way I see it. I didn't buy his book. I'm sorry. Now here is the Janus in Matthew 16, 18, briefly stated, we'll go through each premise later. Top left, there in Hebrew characters, is the Aramaic word for firstborn. When transliterated into Greek, it's spelt precisely like Bethel's stone. When Christ saw that Peter had confessed divine revelation, is born again, he declares, you really are firstborn of the divine revelation. And then looking forward, he sees him as the cave of stone, but there is the intervention of the church. The church must be built first. The resurrection of Christ has to uh, come first before the keys even exist. But the keys do imply that he will be in a cave, Petra, Petros, water-bearing relationship with Christ. That is what's suggested by the apposition of Petros and Petra, that there is a relationship, a later, lesser to greater analogy. And that's what happens there in First Peter. Peter has the living stone and lively stone. So he transferred to the church that same water-bearing relationship. We'll get into that later. But it's right here. It's what obscures the Janus is the linear timeline that we have to follow the resurrection of Christ intervenes. But Petros is that Janus hominum, and it is looking forward. The keys imply that Peter will be the Petros Kepha, water-bearing, lethos rock in the church, part of that channel of God's grace, so he'll have the keys that can open the door into heaven. Once that channel is established, there's the keys, and there's Peter. The keys do not exist apart from the channel of God's grace. Therefore, when Peter received the keys, it implies he had become a Kepha Petros lively stone of the church. And since Cyrus Gordon discovered Janus parallelisms, they've been finding them everywhere in the Old Testament. I think the same thing is going to happen in the New. In fact, I have a few that I'm going to suggest for the list. But it's by no means exhaustive. I've been focused on this. And also cab driving. This is like the echo of a Janus. A, a ripple from an actual Janus tossed into the lake. Because Christ created this two-way perspective when he said, You are Petros. And it was also surnaming Simon Petros Stone at the same time. So that he became a Kepha Petros water-bearing rock. This Janus exists. Whatsoever you bind on earth or loose on earth shall be bound or loosed in heaven. But there is no actual hominem here. The implied Peter looking back, God looking forward is not only possible, but it's not in the text. But this echo of a Janus is here precisely because there is a Janus in Matthew 16, 18.
Now here is another near Janus. Peter has applied to the church the Janus parallelism, Matthew 16, 18. The church has now got a relationship with Christ, a living stone, lively stone relationship. As newborn babes, they have tasted the Lord is gracious. That's looking back. They drank of the living water, which in this figurative language, drinking is like believing. So they believed Christ, now they're saved. Looking forward, they have become the spiritual house, the holy priesthood. Now they are lively stones. This is the Janus that Christ established. That duality is right there in Matthew 16, 18. Struck and Billerbeck in their commentary, they mention this Aramaic Petros when commenting on Matthew 10, 2. Protos, earliest Simon. It likely came from the Hebrew word Peter, Strong's 63-63, firstborn, firstling, or that which separates or first opens the womb. Now in Matthew 10 to Simon is called Protos. Now some thought that meant he was uh, part of a numbering system, so you got first, second, third, but there is no number two, number three. So it's not a numbering system. And then others argued, well, that's referring to his primacy. Well, Matthew and Mark both report after the event in Matthew 16, 18, they were still arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. So that clearly is no reference to primacy. That leaves only the most parsimonious interpretation. And you combine this with Matthew 4, 18, where you see that Simon was called Petros before he met Jesus. So we have earliest Simon, the one called firstborn. That would be parsimonious. Now the professor says in the next slide that the Aramaic Petros is here in this, uh, this lectionary. I don't really know. I can't read Aramaic. But I've tried to isolate where it is so I could point it out to you. I could be wrong. But that center column has Matthew 16, 18 in it. It's above Matthew uh, 9, but that's a lectionary. So they took portions of the New Testament, and then it's, uh, it's part of this book. So it's not in chronological order here. If you look at that number 18, that center column, you may have to zoom in. One line down, counting from right to left, Third word over, Petros. Now, if you go up two verses to Matthew 16, 16, one line down, two words over, Petros. I believe it's there. I've done my best to isolate it, but I can't read Aramaic. It all looks kind of like chicken scratch to me. I'm sorry, I'm a cab driver. So we're going to have to rely on the professor in the next slide he says it's here, and I think he's right. Now, in his book, Peter and the Rock, you look there on page 34, down towards the bottom, you'll see in English, it says, And I say to thee, thou art Petros, and on this Kepha I shall build my church. And then he comments that these are clearly distinct words. So you're not seeing Kepha twice, like you usually hear about, in that hypothetical Aramaic text that Catholic apologists love to have you focus on to get you away from the Greek, because the Greek is pretty definitive. There's no way the Greek allows Simon to be the rock. Christ is talking to Simon about the female rock. It's like saying, upon her I will build my church. Oh, that ain't Peter. <laughs> So they have to get you to this hypothetical Aramaic. But here now is a Palestinian Aramaic where the Petros does exist. And if you wanted to see where it is in Hebrew, you count from right to left above the, that English text on the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six words over. You got it. There it is. So here in Matthew 4.18, Peter is called Petros before he met Christ. In 4.19, Jesus says, follow me. 
In John 1.40, Andrew is already called Simon Peter's brother, Petros, before they went to seek out Christ. In Matthew 16.18, that's the clincher. That's present tense. Jesus said, you are Petros, not that you became Petros, or I'm changing you now to make you into a Petros. And that's in symmetry with you are Christ. So uh, Jesus didn't become Christ at that time. There's also the element that Christ is being revealed as the Son of God. That's something new. And Christ is returning the favor. And you called me that, and now I'm calling you firstborn. That's something new. Yeah, you know, just repeating a point made earlier. Simon is blessed by Christ when he confessed the revelation of God. Clearly, this is unique because this never happened before, and this kind of response from Christ is incredible. All the other times, it was more like a ho hum. You really believe I'm the Son of God? That because I said that. It was really a nothing, a nothing burger before. This one got Christ's attention. And he says, blessed art thou, and then he calls him Bar Jonah. I've already mentioned how I believe that's a prophet, son of the prophet Jonah. Jesus saw that parallel, and he puts it right there. And that confirms that Simon was born again right here in that text in Matthew 16, 16. Now, the indications that he was born again, firstborn, perhaps we could read the keys as implying that the firstborn of the estate gets the keys, but that might be a little stretch because the church gets them too. However, look at that binding and loosing authority, but compare what Peter got to what the apostles got. They had to have at least two in agreement. Peter did not. That implies he had the firstborn the right of the firstborn, that double portion. So there you have an indication right in the context that Peter is the firstborn of the divine revelation. Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God, firstborn of the gospel of Christ. Well, now that we've established Petros Aramaic is firstborn, we're going to turn our attention to Petros Kepha, as stone. Confirming that it is a homonym are the two radically different perspectives. Matthew clearly has earliest Simon, the one called firstborn, whereas Mark and John are looking at it as the equivalent of Kepha, Cephas. Notice what Mark says, Simon was surnamed Petros, just like James and John were surnamed Sons of Thunder. That's a description. That's not really a proper name. And of course, John says Cephas, when interpreted, is a Petros. Now that we've established Petros, firstborn Aramaic exists, let's look at Cephas, Petros, the water bearing rock. John says that Simon would be called Cephas. There's only one place where that happened, Matthew 16, 18. That's where that prophecy was fulfilled. He, decades later, explains that a stone, Petros, interprets Cephas. Now, some modern translations have Cephas, when translated, is a Petros. Well, then, Petros, when translated, is a Cephas. And that means this text was fulfilled in Matthew 16, 18. Now, if we want to see what Christ intended when he named, surnamed Simon Cephas Petros, we have to look at the Aramaic meaning of Cephas. We're not going to find that in the Greek meaning of stone. In Mark's Gospel, the appearance of the names Simon and Petros corroborate that Simon was surnamed Cephas Petros in Matthew 16, 18, not John 1, I've highlighted Mark 8, 29 because it approximates 
the event at Matthew 16, 18, when the Janus occurred. Before that time, Mark only uses the name Simon to refer to Peter, except when mentioning the actual surnaming in Mark 3.16 and in 5.37 where it seems Christ is requesting only his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, accompany him as he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. That probably explains Mark's choice of Cephas Petros here because it indicates his close personal connection to the Lord. But look what happens after that line of demarcation, that yellow Matthew 16, 18 event. Simon only appears in the words of Christ, so it doesn't count. Thereafter, a burst of Petros Cephas references. It's really quite startling. This clearly confirms that Simon was surnamed Cephas Petros at Matthew 16, 18, not at John 1:42. The Janus event in Matthew 16, 18 is the most likely reason why John says Cephas, by interpretation, is a Petros. He should have used Lethos, just as uh, Peter does in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 on. He transferred all the meanings of Petros, Petra, and Cephas to Lethos when speaking about Christ and the church. John should have done the same thing because Petros and Petra were Attic Greek. They were archaic, passing into non-use. John is writing this decades after the event. So this definitely is his pointing to Matthew 16, 18 as the place where Simon was given the surname Cephas Petros in agreement with Mark. As we can infer from Isaiah, Genesis, and Revelation, when your relationship with God changes, you get a new name. Peter's relationship changed when he was born again. So it follows that he would get a new name, a, water, a, a name that indicates the relationship that he has now entered into with Christ, a water-bearing relationship. Christ is the mass of Petra rock, giving out living water, and Peter is the smaller Kepha rock, out of whose belly is flowing living water. Now, confirming Peter sees the Matthew 16, 18 event as a Janus parallelism, notice how he carried over here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 6, that duality. He's looking back, firstborn, they tasted the living water of the Lord, that he's gracious, and now they are newborn babes desiring sincere milk, and they have become, looking forward, that spiritual house, a holy priesthood. They, too, are now in that Petra, Petros relationship, bearing water with Christ. Out of their belly is flowing rivers of living water. So John considers Cephas the equivalent of Petros. Now, some modern translations have this verse reading, Cephas, when translated, is Petros, Peter. Well, that makes the equivalency even stronger. That means Petros, that appears in Matthew 16, 18, when translated, is a Cephas. Now, if we want to know how Christ was using Cephas Petros when uh, that particular Aramaic was being spoken, we have to look back into the Aramaic texts of that period that reflect that usage to discern that. Well, now we get to the Aramaic usage of Cephas, Kepha, to see exactly how Christ meant it in Matthew 16, 18. Now we're gonna go through this at length because it indicates that Peter has transferred to the church the Janus parallelism, the event of Matthew 16, 18. And you could see that uh, not only by the meanings that are transferred from Petra and Petros onto Lethos, but also the relationship that's set up between living stone and lively stone of the church. So let's get cracking. So the Aramaic that Christ and his disciples spoke is reflected in the Talbot and Targums. Kepha, 
is a rock when bored that will give forth water. Pearls, jewels, precious stones, jewelry. He has transferred Petros, Petra, and Kepha meanings, not only to Christ, but also to the church. And he's doing it in such a way, it clearly he's, he's thinking about the Matthew 16 event, and he's created his own little sermon here, rewording it slightly, but the relationships are still the same. And he's transferred those meanings that Christ used in Matthew 16, 18, onto the church and Christ himself. Going from the top first, a rock when bored gives forth water. Kepha. Now in Deuteronomy, the next arrow down, we see Kepha is equivalent to Petra. So they are equivalent. They're both water-bearing rocks. Jonathan, when he sucked honey out of the rock, his uh, strength, his countenance was strengthened, brightened. His eyes were beamed. That's in 1 Samuel 14, 27. That's like getting spirit or life from that honey that he sucked out of the rock. Oil out of the flinty rock. Oil often symbolizes Holy Spirit. So you're getting life, divine life, from the flinty rock. So there's the connection with the imagery of living water. It's like saying you're getting spirit from the rock. And we see that reflected bottom arrow that living stone, lively stone relationship that Christ established right there in Matthew 16, 18, the Petra, Petros, big stone, little stone relationship. It's a water-bearing relationship, a life-bearing relationship. The living water comes from Christ, goes through the uh, lively stones of the church, Peter being one of them, and then out of their belly flows rivers of living water. There's the logic of the entire uh, symbolism. Oil, spirit, life from the flinty rock. Spiritual rock. Christ is that spiritual life-giving rock from whom flows living water. Moses was supposed to strike the rock once, and then out of it would come water, and all who drank lived. Well, he kind of blew that one. But we see the Petra appears in the Greek Septuagint of this text, that context. There's the connection. Now, lest someone create a straw man over the use of Petra for Christ, the metaphor is apt. It, Petra, rock, is anything immutable. Now, Christ himself applied it to his sayings. And we know that he also applied it to the revelation that the Father gave to Peter. That's two times, two different objects. And if Paul adds Christ himself a third to the list, there is no contradiction. Let's uh, sideline that possible straw man right now. In the Targums of Proverbs 17.8, Kepha is a precious stone. The Greek Septuagint uh, translates gracious wage. So it's a stone of grace. It turns aside wrath and opens up ways to prosper that might not otherwise be open to you. Notice Peter has transferred the idea of precious to Jesus Christ. He is like our magic stone. By the blood of the Lamb, the wrath of God has been turned aside. It no longer prevents us from entering in. And now we, in Christ, we prosper spiritually. He truly is like our magic stone. By him, we were allowed to do business. That's very interesting. So the equivalent drinking is believing. Believing is drinking in this kind of imagery. You have the newborn babes. They tasted the Lord as gracious. Well, that means they believed in him and then they were born again. Same thing. So in this duality, this parallelism, we have to keep in mind the two different perspectives of time. There is the eternal perspective, where on the bottom, even though we're still on earth, we're already seated in heavenly places. So from God's perspective, all these things are past. Christ, when he saw uh, Peter confess that he was the Christ, right then he became firstborn, 
but he also became the Kepha Petros water-bearing rock of the future that uh, in our time wouldn't happen until after Christ rose from the dead. But right there is when he was surnamed Kepha Petros. That's when John 142 was fulfilled. You shall be called Cephas Petros. And that's where it happened, Matthew 16, 18. And the interval of the church and the gates of hell is not a contradiction to this. That's actually more like a statement of events. This is the progress. This is how the timeline will go. You get uh, your firstborn now, and you will be that water-bearing rock after I rise from the dead and create the church. The keys do not exist apart from the channel of God's grace. Therefore, when Peter received the keys, it implies he had become a Kepha Petros, lively stone of the church. So, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, these asymmetric Janus parallelisms were all over the Old Testament, and nobody knew it. Until Cyrus Gordon, in 1978, he pointed them out. Now they're finding them everywhere. I think the same thing's going to happen in the New Testament. We're going to see a lot of Janus parallelisms and near Janus parallelisms, like I found here in Matthew 16, 19, which is the ripple of an actual Janus there in Matthew 16, 18. Christ created that duality, and like a ripple in time, we see the duality carry forward into the binding and loosing authority of the church. That's in the past. We have Peter looking forward as God. He does it in heaven. Again, the duality that Christ created in Matthew 16, 18 gets applied to the church. They are looking back, newborn babes, because they tasted the living water that the Lord is gracious. Just like Peter, when he was born again, he believed. Looking forward, now they are lively stones in that Petra, Petros, Kepha, water-bearing relationship with Christ, built up in a spiritual household, a holy priesthood communicating the grace of God to the earth. Now, of course, this lowly cabbie wants to be the first to discover yet another Janus parallelism in the New Testament. And I want to be part of the race. Revelation 13, 18. That is an asymmetric Janus parallelism on the number 666. John is using double entendre. He's saying count to the number of the beast. Count meaning, as with pebbles, it's a simple matter of subtraction. you got to subtract Adonicum's father, who's named Adonicum, and then you get the number 666 there in Ezra, I mean, uh, in Neremiah 718. Now, it is the number of a man, because Adonicum, his son, has 666 kids, so it's the number of a man. He generated that number by having all those children. So you get 666 looking forward. Backward, forward, there's your duality, your parallelism. There's your asymmetric. That's the solution. The name of the beast will be Adonicum. So there is an overwhelming mass of irrefutable evidence. Should convince everyone beyond any reasonable doubt that Matthew 16, 18 happened. The reason why the other uh, gospel writers didn't mention it, you needed to construct that parallelism perfectly for it to work. And they left that to Matthew. He'd done a superb job at keeping the timeline of events in there. He kept that uh, greater to lesser analogy. Everything is perfect there. It's incredible what he did. The other writers, clearly, they just left it to him because it would have been difficult. And it's clear from all the other indications that it's authentic scripture. The Janus alone, while being the most elegant proof of it, we have all these other corroborations that the event happened. I already mentioned a few. Second, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 6. We have... Uh, John 142, he's clearly pointing to the event. Then here you have in Romans, clearly Paul has reworked that material. 
and he has uh, bringing Christ down from above as being the father revealing Peter to Peter the Petra of God thou art the Christ son of the living God and that is the word of faith that is divine revelation and the word that the Apostles preach the Lord Jesus you have the identity of Christ the Lord Jesus confess publicly you believe it in your heart you confess it with your mouth you saved. upon that the church is built you can't get more proof that the text is authentic scripture all the scholarship that doubted this they it needs to be reevaluated how high do you want to consider these these people in your estimation of truth who can show you the truth but clearly they have misled a lot of people for a long time it's almost like uh, it, to me it recalls what uh, Nebuchadnezzar said to his soothsayers you people have been here and you're all frauds you can't tell me what I dreamed you can't tell me the truth then obviously you've been here under false pretenses that's the way I look at a lot of this they're not critical thinkers they they missed all these indications that they're wrong and they ignored it and instead of asking themselves well gee this looks imprecise the Greek is kind of fuzzy the metaphors don't work instead of questioning their interpretation they question the authenticity of the verse of Scripture and that really is a serious error now this is a parallel to today just as today the Jainist parallelism Matthew 16 18 causes problems just as it caused the translators in the of the Old Testament problems whenever they saw the Jainist depending on which perspective they took yeah, they got confused it's interesting to note that was evident since the beginning when that knowledge of that Aramaic Petros was lost from that point on the church was getting a little confused of the 16 who thought the rock was Christ they are looking at that confession of Peter and they see the identity of Jesus as being confessed so they say okay the rock is Christ the 44 they're looking at that confession and they see the identity of Christ but they're thinking okay no it's got to be his confession but in their own writings there are occasions where they take the other side or they take a different view because that's what a Janus does to you when you see it from one direction it looks like certain things have more prominence and when you look at another other things take up the view so you you begin to waver between opinions and I just want to bring to your remembrance when all them experts come charging out of the woodwork claiming I don't know what I'm talking about and I got to be wrong and all you got to do is buy their book look at this text one more time and remember they missed it they totally missed it it went over their head and it's so simple it should have been the first thing that they discussed whenever they discuss Matthew 16 16 through 18 it should have been right on Matthew 7 24 and 25 and yet they were not clearly I have some credibility that they do not have so you need to evaluate carefully if you think I'm just wrong because you know he's a cab driver what's he know well I knew this and your experts did not so that's something to remember as you evaluate this video now I'm promised I would uh, put this slide back in at the last two like I did in the beginning and I, I probably should have deleted some of this or reworded it because I did delete some duplicated slides on the way but uh, frankly I'm tired and I got to go to work soon so I'm not gonna bother <clears throat> if you if you're gonna nitpick this list is oh gee the slides gone for that particular point well okay I was too lazy to delete the line of text after I deleted the redundant slide I'm sorry it happens peace be to you and just one final word God bless well I couldn't leave this verse unmentioned it's implicit Petra is Jesus is the Christ son of God because believing it is how the church is growing clearly that's how Christ is building his church on that Petra 
if that weren't so, John wouldn't have wrote for us to believe it. Now that's really strong. That's implicit. www.endtimenews.net. You will see a lot of poorly written articles, but I do have a unique perspective on scripture, but I'm not a writer. I'm not a video maker either. <laughs> I'm sorry for the poor quality of these videos and my writing. I am obtuse. I'm trying to improve in between fares and my cab. I'm trying to get better. www.endtimenews.net. If you go there, I am not a tax deductible organization. If you donate anything, I'm going to devote every dime to getting this video out. Either it'll be to get a professional to make them a hell of a lot better than I do, or it'll be to pay Google AdWords to kind of advertise it and get it out there. Either way, every dime would be spent on this. However, it's not tax deductible. You'd have to pay your own taxes, bud. I ain't going to pay them. So you pay them. I will spend everything on this, though you have my word on that. This is relevant to Greek primacy. It's also relevant to the integrity of the New Testament. It kind of indicates a lot of what scholarship has had to say about the Bible, the text, is all crap. It's falsehood built upon falsehood. I, frankly, when I read some of this uh, prattle about the text and the likely reading, I'm reading nothing but a massive violation of Ackman's razor and total subjective nonsense. I mean, I might as well go listen to someone babble in tongues. <laughs> it's really, it makes no sense. <laughs> okay, enough of said. Believe the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Eternal Son. He said not one jot or tittle be lost. In meaning, he didn't mean the little marks. He meant meaning because he said none of it will pass till all is fulfilled. You can't fulfill little diacritical marks. So you can describe a picture with a thousand words, and the words could be in different order. They could have different variations in spelling. There might be some words present and other words not present, but still communicate the same picture precisely. So if you think of it that way, and then you look at our the reliability of the majority text, how they, the, the change is, it, it's inconsequential. It clearly, Christ predicted properly that not one jot or tittle, not the tiniest bit of meaning, would be lost in our Bibles. I personally like the uh, Texas Receptus, but suppose I grew up with the Aramaic, the Peshit. I'm sure there's enough in there, more than enough, where I wouldn't feel deprived of anything. The same thing with some of the other major reputable translations that have been around a long time. But I do have a problem with Bibles that are literally creations of all these bad texts. And they've, 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 they've subtracted from the scripture and they've diminished it. You can't, once you buy into the premise that you have to rely on manuscripts yanked out of the, the garbage dump, and that were hiding away in monasteries for all hundreds of years, and nobody knew about them. Once you accept that premise, that idea of scripture is diminished, and you see it reflected in the commentaries. They'll quote this apocrypha crap, which is nothing more than satanic disinformation. They quote that stuff like it's equal to scripture. They barely mention that, hey, this is just really, you know, it's crap. It, they quote it as though you got your choice. You could either accept what Scripture has to say, or you could go ahead and jump what this Apocrypha has to say. And it's junk. I think there's going to be a lot of screaming among the scholars in the Day of Judgment. They diminish the Word of God and they subtract it from His Word. I personally prefer the Textus Receptus. It retained that reference to the Trinity in 1 John. And if you study the Greek, and a lot of the experts say, yeah, it belongs there. The grammar kind of indicates that's where it belongs. And I accept that. It's like the long ending in Mark. What moron would add that to the scripture if, if it wasn't really scripture? You know, everybody wants to take it out. Well, that you can understand. Putting it in, I don't understand that. I don't think that would be logical. And then when you read it, you realize there's nothing heretical there. And it's 
and it's kind of uh, confirming everything that was said so i i like it it's scripture and i have no problem with the textus receptus and, or any any reliable uh part of that uh, majority text i think that's all the very word of god and the jots and tittles of meaning are not lost so peace be to you i personally i believe christ is uh, coming soon and i have firm uh, faith in his word and you need that to stand in the end time that strong delusion that's going to come it's going to be a terrible time and if your faith in god's word and your faith in christ is shaken when that strong delusion comes uh it's going to be a terrible time you don't want to go there you want to have be firm in your faith so you could stand in the day of temptation peace be to you if you don't remember donate remember it's not tax deductible pay your taxes we don't want you to go to jail peace <laughs>